And joining us now is Leonard Spector, a weapons and nonproliferation expert with the Monterey Institute of International Studies, and Julian Barnes of the Wall Street Journal. Julian, I want to start with you today on first on today's UN vote. What reaction are you getting from U.S. officials? Are, do they have any further steps planned or possible? Well, there wasn't a lot of surprise that uh, Russia and China made this new uh, made this move today. Um, the Russians have been blocking this for a while. Officials I've been talking to have said uh, it is almost fruitless to continue to push Russia for um, the solution to this. Uh, Russia is not going to change its position until the Assad regime uh, begins to fall. So, and yet they went ahead again and pushed, an, uh, pushed another vote today. That's right. And a lot of, but a lot of military officials think it's going to be the events on the ground that uh, are going to drive this forward, not the events in uh, diplomatic events. All right. So, Leonard Spector, I want to turn to the, the chemical weapons question. For, for, fill in a little bit of the picture. How, what's known about the size and scope of the program? program there in Syria? Uh, the size and scope is uh, both are immense. Uh, the quantity of materials, hundreds of tons, and the uh, variety of material, everything from the World War I gases to the very modern uh, persistent nerve gases, the, the, the slimes, as they say, that will uh, stay in place for a while, uh, for days, uh, and remain uh, dangerous. And built up over time? And, and for what purposes or what intention? Well, in principle, uh, this is a response perhaps to Israeli capabilities. It may also be just a very uh, significant symbol of Assad and his father's uh, strength in the region and a way of uh, demonstrating Syrian leadership. Uh, but uh, certainly there is both a military and a symbolic side to this. Now, you've tracked the uh, chemical weapons facilities around Syria. We have a map that your organization put together. We'll show our audience. Tell us what we're seeing. Well, I think uh, you're seeing some chemical weapon storage sites uh, off to the right in the more uh, rural parts of the, um, of the country, and then chemical weapon production sites uh, toward the left uh, in the more built-up areas uh, where most of the fighting has been. But the countryside supposedly is much more in the hands and, uh, of the Free Syrian Army, and if there are chemical weapon sites there that are now falling behind, uh, let's call them enemy lines or insurgent lines, uh, you may have a situation where there may be a transfer of the authority over these sites uh, before long. Now, Julian, you and, and, your, and your colleagues at the Journal reported that the weapon the other day that the weapons were being moved. What, what more is known? What can you update us on? Well, you know, the uh, officials we've talked to are still divided on, on what this means. There are some who think that this was uh, moving uh, uh, weapons from sites that were threatened by the rebels um, to more secure areas. There are others who worry that uh, this is... You mean away from uh, potential uh, away, insurgents? Right, away from mm -hmm. the, the rebels and the insurgent mm -hmm. lines mm -hmm. to, to safeguard them for the regime. Mm -hmm. um, but there are others who think that the movement was a precursor to potentially using them uh, as a part of an ethnic cleansing campaign or as a part of uh, on the battlefield against the rebels. And certainly officials have spoken up two days in a row, Leon Panetta at the Pentagon yesterday and again today. So there's some level of concern. Right, and a clear warning that uh, this will invite an international response. And that's why some officials think that this is, it will not be uh, President Assad who makes the order to use this, but only after he falls from power, remnants of his regime might, as a last ditch effort, start to use these weapons. Well, Leonard Spector, what, what, what is the level of concern that you're hearing? Well, uh, one of the administration uh, uh, people I've uh, contacted. Uh, indicated that there was indeed growing concern about the risk of use. I frankly, when I spoke to uh, in Congress uh, earlier today, felt that that was uh, more far-fetched because uh, Assad would be so concerned about the possibility of intervention, but that seems to have been discounted. Even though we've given warnings, there is a sense in the administration, from what I gather, that the risk of use is, uh, is real. What, 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 are, what, what scenarios are being spun out in which they might be used? Well, this would be sort of a last-ditch uh, effort to uh, suppress uh, the opposition um, and or to cow the civilian population. Uh, certainly once they get used in a civilian setting, uh, there's going to be enormous hesitation to sort of challenge the regime. I mean, these are very, very deadly weapons and they'll be frightening because they're so different from uh, the conventional explosives that, you know, we are sort of getting used to. Are, are they easy to use? Are, are they, can they quickly be put together and used? Well, if there are artillery shells, you simply substitute a chemical artillery shell for a uh, a traditional one, so that mm -hmm. part is easy. Sometimes they have to be prepared, but uh, these are intended for battlefield use in many cases, and that means rapid uh, preparation. And the ability to scare and kill lots of people. Absolutely, especially if they're in the open, at a market or in the streets, 
uh, it could be very deadly and just uh, so incredible panic. Well, does that sound like what they're, they're worried about? And, and what kind of, therefore what? What are U.S. officials able to prepare for or, or do? Well, um, you know, that is uh, one scenario people are very worried about because it's not just once you use it, the panic spreads and you get a lot of displaced people, a lot of uh, the refugee crisis gets that much worse as people, you know, flee areas. Um, there's this view that it could be used in the Alawite areas where the uh, President Assad's, uh, you know, uh, ethnicity and to clear out Sunnis uh, uh, from those areas. Um, you know, there are plans. Um, should the Assad regime fall and should uh, that to have uh, U.S. allies in the region secure some of these sites, mainly Jordan, Turkey. Now, should those allies be unwilling, there are contingency plans for uh, the U.S. to secure some of those, but, but that's a scenario that the administration is very reluctant uh, and hopes does not, it doesn't come to that. But this is a whole other potential danger, right? I mean, if Assad falls, what happens to these things if they fall into who knows what hands? Right. Well, I think what our job, in a sense, the United States and our allies, is to uh, create an environment in which they stay under governmental control, maybe even under the control of the current guardians, but with a uh, superstructure of the Free Syrian Army or the new government of Syria uh, taking charge of them. But they're managed by people that understand the weapons and can be uh, know the inventory and can maintain the security around them. So it's a very difficult uh, game between a transition on the one hand, but trying to preserve as much of the protective measures uh, as you can. We did that uh, with some uh, success in Libya, although not uh, complete by any means. And I'm wondering, I mean, going back to where we started here with the day at the UN and Russia playing the role it's playing, Russia is close to Syria. I mean, can, does, can the U.S. ask the Russians for help on this chemical weapons issue? Is that possible? Uh, one would hope so. Uh, certainly, if uh, there was a risk of loss and uh, you wanted to bring a, an international team of some kind in, mm. in, I think you'd want to have the Russians as part of it to uh, reinforce the credibility and not to uh, sort of isolate them, but try to uh, get them as part of the, of the picture. Word on that. Yeah, and as a part of an end game, that's how Russia could uh, switch to the other side by being pay, taking a role to help secure these weapons of mass destruction. All right, Julian Barnes and Leonard Spector, thank you both thank very you. much. And we delve deeper into some of these same questions online, where you'll also find the map we showed of possible locations for chemical weapons facilities.